What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ Bucky uh, with you here. And Buck, man, we've got uh, we've got the final playoff game we can break down today. Uh, that was a thrashing. The Dallas Cowboys, kind of surprising to me how easily they handled the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and how bad Tom Brady looked. We're going to get to all that stuff uh, in just a little bit. Uh, I do want to start off this show, though, with some news that just came down. So it's that time of year. You're going to have uh, coaches dismissed. It's not just head coaches. Uh, the news that just came down as we're getting ready to start this podcast, the Chargers, uh, the team that I cover, uh, doing their, their broadcast. Joe Lombardi, offensive coordinator, he is out. Shane Day, the quarterback coach, is out. I want to get your thoughts on their dismissal, uh, kind of what you think is the future there, what they should look for as a coordinator, but also piggyback that with a thought now. We have six coordinator jobs open, six offensive coordinators. The two teams in L.A., the Jets in New England and the AFC East. We've got the Washington Commanders, the Tennessee Titans. So what do you think about the Chargers and where they go, and what do you think is the most attractive of those six openings? Well, it's easy because the team we're going to talk about, the Chargers, has the most attractive opening because the first thing that you start with is the quarterback. They have the most attractive quarterback in Justin Herbert, and so everyone wants to be a part of that because if you get that piece of the puzzle, it allows you to really easily build around him. And so that makes this job a prime job, and it makes it one that candidates are really going to be trying to scratch and claw and put themselves in a position to get. Uh, look, it's unfortunate whenever someone is dismissed. Lombardi uh, did a really good job when it came to Justin Herbert and helping him go to the next level. Uh, but when you have a loss like they had and you have a season where you're not necessarily able to run the ball and do some of the things that they struggle with, like in the red zone and those things, they were going to look for change, particularly when it was all coming down on the head coach. It's easier to dismiss the offensive coordinator and keep the head coach and give him an opportunity to find another guy that maybe can max out the talent on this offense. I believe the thing that the Chargers need to find, they need to find uh, a way to make the game easier for Justin Herbert. And the one way that you can make it easier is having some semblance of a running game and a complimentary play action passing game that not only offsets the pass rush, but it creates more big play opportunities down the field. We know play action lures linebackers to the line of scrimmage, creates huge voice at that intermediate and deep level. And so I'm looking for someone that can add a little more power run game, bootleg motion movement passing game, and the big play element, because in my mind, that's all this team needs to get over the top. Yeah, it's interesting to see where they go here. I, I do think the run game needs to be addressed, at first and foremost. They have to get that solved. I think everybody's looking at this, oh, who do we put around Justin Herbert to help Justin Herbert go to the next level? The thing that's going to help Justin Herbert go to the next level is some semblance of a run game. And off of that run game, as you mentioned, being able to utilize play action, it, they weren't tied together very well in that area with the Chargers. So they got to find a way where they can run the football and then off of that, give him some opportunities to get the ball down the field. A lot of those chunk plays... You know, we've seen, we've seen the shots. We've seen some shots periodically uh, with the Chargers, but I think that marries up better. You get somebody that understands the run game. Maybe as a coordinator, somebody that understands, you know, line of scrimmage play, and that's kind of maybe his emphasis. I'd be okay with that. And then get a quarterback coach, uh, because that's another opening mm -hmm. that they have that can really drill down on Justin and clean up some of the mechanical stuff we saw kind of show up in that playoff game a little bit. Some of the arm angle stuff getting him back over the top with his arm slot. It's going to eliminate a lot of these tip balls that we've seen this year. I think there's a stat out there. He's had more balls tipped than Kyler Murray, and he's, what, six, seven inches taller. So uh, little things like that. I think you can get a, a solid quarterback coach, preferably, in my opinion, one that's played in the NFL, uh, give him a lot of credibility in that room and see if he can't help tighten that up a little bit. But I, I think the run game uh, and being a more physical team is going to help them not only with explosive plays, but if they find themselves with a lead in the future, as we saw in the game you were at against Jacksonville, you'd be able to close it out if you can run the football. They could not do that uh, previously. And we'll, we'll have plenty of time to get into the personnel they need to add, speed receiver, a bigger back to complement Austin Eckler going forward. Uh, but I think these coaching hires are going to be big for them. Yeah, no, they're going to be huge. And I think also when you think about the overarching theme of the team, Brandon Staley likes to stand at the podium and talk about his team being a tough, physical football team. Sometimes you want to make sure that the actions match the words, meaning that in these critical moments when you need to get the dirty yards, that your first impulse is not to throw it, but sometimes you may hand it to a running back because there's a level of toughness that you have to show when you try and grind it out in those moments. And so I think 
all of the stuff that happened last season and this I mean well this season and the stuff that happened in the playoffs can help the Chargers become a better team and probably a more dynamic team if they're able to add the running game I'm curious to see who that hire is going to be because it's a big one it's a huge one for Brandon Staley yeah six coordinator jobs open on the offensive side of the ball we to see uh, what names emerge for those gigs are they rehashed old names or the young up-and-comers creative minds uh, something to follow here as we move forward. Another piece of news just came down uh, in the uh, in the recent past here. The Cardinals, they hire Monty Austin for the guy we used to scout with on the road. You see Monty all the time when he was with the Patriots. Uh, a really, really good dude. Uh, spent a long time, won a lot of Super Bowls there in New England. Then went on to, uh, to Tennessee with John Robinson, who he knew from their days with the Patriots and was working there in their front office. He gets the job there uh, with the Cardinals. Now, uh, I, I like Monty a lot. I, I think Monty's really sharp. I think he knows what he's doing. Um, at the press conference, though, I was taken aback a little bit, Buck, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it because I saw you tweet about it. Talked about how we don't want any ego. Uh, we don't want any ego in this organization. And then he used the phrase kind of the Cardinal way, which is a little bit of a takeoff there on the Patriot way. Uh, just your thoughts on kind of the way this thing's headed and what they need to do uh, to get that ship righted there in Arizona. Yeah, no, I just think you have to be careful. And I hope for Monty's sake, because he is a good scout, he is a good dude, uh, haven't seen him and watched him on the road. Like the one thing that you want to be careful is that uh, your vision for the team is your vision. It's not where you came from and all things. And I saw other quotes where he talked about every building is different. And so he just has to realize that the culture in Arizona is going to be vastly different than what you had in Tennessee and what you had in New England. And you have to be able to take all those experiences, put them together and make it right for what you have in front of you with the Arizona Cardinals. I'll say this. I was a little taken aback when he said the ego thing because I was like, man, to have any confidence, any swag, you got to have a lot of self-esteem and self-belief. And so what I think he might have been trying to convey is, hey, we don't want the selfishness, the stuff where people are That's the putting word, themselves yeah. over the, the, the team and that stuff. Like if he's talking about that. Cool, but if he's trying to make this team one that's a collection of robots, that won't work. And I think that is the struggle that some Patriots guys have had when they've gone and run their own programs. They may try and run it like the Patriots, but they don't necessarily wield the same hammer that Bill Belichick. I think in time, he'll figure out the personality that he wants to the team. I just hope that he's careful that he doesn't choke down all the personality from those players because everyone isn't the same and you got to be able to get a collection of 53 heading in the right direction and sometimes that takes a bunch of different personalities uh, on the squad. Well I know a lot of criticism for uh, some of the first round picks they had there in Tennessee that didn't work out but I do think what John Robinson was able to accomplish and Monty had a front row seat there was they had an identity they were physical uh, they were a line of scrimmage team mm -hmm. and Mike Vrabel was a part of that as well so I think I'm, I'm all for that if you want to take that from the Patriots to Tennessee like they did and take that to Arizona I'm fine with that we're going to be physical we're going to be tough uh, we're going to find tough-minded guys but yeah you got to have some personality you're going to have some brashness you're going to have some swagger there's absolutely nothing wrong with that I think you hit it though selfish is the thing you're trying to avoid there and I think he's look he's He's sending a message to the quarterback through what he's saying. I think that's pretty obvious. Oh, for sure. Us, you know, I understand. How, I understand how I that. interpreted that. I mean, I mean, don't, I, yeah, DJ, I, I, I get that? that. I mean, I, I think that's a direct message. Direct message, and he was kind of speaking the quarterback's language by doing it through the press, and so he's letting him know. He's putting all of those guys, because there's some other guys too. He's putting everyone on notice that it's going to be a change and everyone needs to fall in line. And so he'll do that before he has that first meeting where he meets with not only the organization, but when he meets with the team to let them know, hey, here's how we're going to proceed going forward. Yeah, no doubt. Um, all right, uh, we're going to get a little bit later on in the show to talk about some top corners in this draft as we kind of get closer now. Uh, I'm going to be digging in a lot on these players. Bucky's watching them as well. He's going to have his, his top five list. I'm going to have my top 50 list. It's that time of year. Mock drafts, all that good stuff. So we'll talk about some corners a little bit later on in the show, uh, as well as the top 25 rookies from this past season. But I, I do want to quickly, before we get out, take a little break here. Uh, Cowboys Bucks last night, it was a thrashing. I thought the Cowboys pass rush, which had been a little missing over the last month and change, showed up in a big way. A lot of four-man pressure, and they got after Tom Brady. And I think not only a credit to them and what they're able to do creating pressure on Brady, I think it was a reminder 
Man, Tom Brady has to move two inches to the left or to the right. He is not the same quarterback. Yeah, you know, DJ, this is funny. Um, you wouldn't think this at the time, but the best thing that happened to the Cowboys might have been the thrashing that they took at the hands of the Commanders in Week 18. Because when you have a loss the way that they had, they certainly, uh, the coaches have their attention. Meaning that now Mike McCarthy and those guys say, hey guys, we tried it your way, it didn't work. Here's how we're going to attack this game in the wild card round. And that is the best that I've seen the Cowboys play in a long time. Offensively, defensively, they were tied together with the exception of their kicking woes uh, with the PAT that they have to figure out quickly how to resolve. Man, they played really good complimentary football, ran the ball. Dak Prescott was in his bag, didn't turn it over, made smart decisions. And then we talked about the defense and how they knocked Tom Brady around. Michael Parsons was all over the place and the defense looked fast. And they're going to need to kind of take that effort, bottle it up, and they're going to have to duplicate it when they have an opportunity on the 49ers next weekend. Yeah, I, I'm. You know, we'll have plenty of time to dig into that game. We'll preview it on the next podcast. But I'm fascinated to see what the 49ers do. They came out throwing it last week um, against the Seahawks. I would imagine seeing this Cowboys pass rush get heated up a little bit. I think you see the Niners. You know, call a little bit of an audible here. Try and run the football. Mm-hmm. Try and see if they can get those guys in their heels a little bit. Slow them down. Uh, do not let that Cowboys pass rush get cranked up. If the pass rush plays like this. That, they have a good shot of knocking off San Francisco. As good as San Francisco is, I mean, Dak plays like he played, um, getting a chance to you know really stay inside the pocket, make things happen. He was able to extend some plays, move around, and make things happen. It's a dangerous Cowboy team. You know, we kind of hadn't been talking about them for a while. They haven't been playing their best ball, but if they show up and play to their level, to their ceiling, yeah, they, they'll more than give San Francisco mm-hmm. a ball game. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the number one thing that Dallas has to answer: toughness and physicality. Last time they played in the postseason, the San Francisco 49ers beat them up. How far, how much progress have the Cowboys made in that area coming to this game? That is what it's going to come down to. We can talk about all the X's and O's, but you know how the 49ers will want to play. They're going to want to make it a fist fight in a phone booth, and we will see if the Cowboys can take some of the glitz and glam and put it away and put on a a performance as a blue-collar squad. That is something that typically has not been in their DNA. No doubt. Uh, That'll be a fun one again. We'll preview that on the next episode. All right, we're going to take a quick little break right now. Uh, When we come back, we're going to dig into the top 25 rookies of the 2022 campaign. Uh, Some teams showing up with multiple members, including one team that had four uh, in the top 25. We'll jump into that right after this break. NFL Plus is here, which means no matter where you are, this is how you football. You can stream live, local, and primetime games on your phone or tablet, 45-minute game replays with NFL Plus Premium, and more. This is the NFL for every fan. This is football freedom. This is your game on the go. Go to plus.nfl.com and sign up now. All right, Buck, I I teased it there uh, as we went to the break about top 25 rookies. I can kind of rip through this top 10 here and get your... Your thoughts. We start with a couple Jets in the top three. Sauce Gardner, number one. Garrett Wilson, uh, number three. In between them, you've got Aiden Hutchinson from the Lions, uh, followed by Chris Olave at four here. We've got Tariq Woolen, Seahawks at five. Kenneth Walker, Seahawks at six. Brock Purdy, who we're going to get to in just a minute. Uh, he's there at seven. Jalen Petrie from the Texans at eight. Another Texans player, Damian Pierce at nine. And George Karloftis at 10 from the Chiefs. Uh, the Lions, four players in the top 25. Heck of a rookie class and one of the main reasons they were able to get this season turned around. And I would say the Jets, if you don't have the injury to Brees Hall, the way he was kind of rolling, they might end up with the top three rookies in the entire class. Yeah, now I think there's a common denominator in terms of the rookie class performing as it related to the performance of the team. Uh, A lot of times when we talk about the draft, uh, DJ, we get excited about draft picks, but we normally don't expect the class to make a significant impact on the performance of the team. Well, when you look at a handful of teams, the New York Jets, the Detroit Lions, the Seattle Seahawks, their rookie classes came in and helped them probably play at a higher level than we ever expected. And so when you get that kind of immediate impact and production from your rookie class, it not only speaks to the, the scouting department doing a really good job identifying guys that are great fits, it speaks to the coaching staff developing 
and also putting those players on the field to give them an opportunity to play. So much of the struggles that we have as an organization stems from, A, the front office and the coaches not being aligned. The front office likes players. Coaches are looking for the veterans. But in each of those situations, there was complete alignment. Because of that, you had opportunities for the young guys and the guys took advantage of their chances. Yeah, the exciting thing is in Seattle and in Detroit, you're going to have the same coaching staff, the same philosophy. I think these guys take an even bigger leap here in year number two. You look at the Texans having two in the top ten. going to be a new staff, uh, new scheme, new philosophy. Hopefully those guys uh, pick up right where they left off and you don't see a sophomore slump, something to keep an eye on. Uh, at number seven there, though, was Brock Purdy. Obviously the quarterback position and how he's played uh, would uh, would require him to be higher on the list. He just hadn't started enough games. Uh, I couldn't put him over those other guys based off the limited number of games that he's played. But he is in the postseason, and he is a young quarterback in the postseason, which is what I want to get to next here, Buck, because we've got eight teams left. The oldest quarterback left in the postseason is Dak Prescott, 29 years old. You've got Mahomes, 27, Josh Allen and Burrow at 26, Daniel Jones is 25, Hurts is 24, Trevor Lawrence and Brock Purdy, 23. Uh, so the average age of the eight quarterbacks left is 25 years old. What do you take away from that? What does it mean? It's a young man's game. And as much as we loved seeing Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady and even uh, Matt Ryan and Drew Brees, like what is the reality of the game is when you get older, the lack of mobility really limits what you can do offensively. All of the guys that you mentioned, not only the age averaging out to 25, all of them are outstanding athletes. You know, when we put the grade on them, all those guys we grade out at B, B plus athletes or better. And so when you think about the game, you think about the defense and the pass rushers that are playing in our league and the superheroes that can leap tall buildings in a single bound and the big guys up front that can push the pocket, uh, you cannot play with a sitting duck at quarterback anymore. And so teams are realizing that you're taking advantage of the athleticism that these young quarterbacks that are coming into the league possess. You also, for a lot of them, are taking advantage of the rookie contract. And so when you have the rookie contract and you can surround these guys with better uh, firepower and playmakers on the perimeter, it gives them a chance to have success. And so we talk about it, we talk about it over and over again. The one thing that I would like to see, not necessarily in this case, but with other cases, it takes patience with some of these guys. If you're going to put young guys on the field, it takes patience, particularly if you don't have everything right around them. You got to give them time to develop and see them pop. And I think Daniel Jones is a testament to that. Yeah, and you've got a couple of them that have already been paid. We've talked a lot about over the years being on a rookie deal and how that allows you to spread your resources elsewhere because a quarterback doesn't cost you that much. You look at it here, you've got you know Purdy's on a rookie deal, Trevor's on a rookie deal, Hertz is on a rookie deal, Daniel Jones on a rookie deal, uh, Burrow still on a rookie deal. Josh Allen, Mahomes, and, and Dak have all been paid. So a little bit of a mixture there. I think what you see is those older guys on this list, you know, relatively speaking, have, uh, have evolved enough where they can carry people around and maybe they're missing a piece. You look at, at Kansas City, you can't afford to bring everybody back, but the quarterback's now gotten to the level where he can build other guys around him and elevate their level of play. Um, that's going to be key for these guys as they get to their second contract, this, this next wave that's right behind those guys. Mm -hmm. um, do you develop enough where you can afford to lose some of your key players because you can elevate their play. That's the kind of the mixture there on this list of young quarterbacks. There is still a difference between the guys who've got that second deal versus the guys on the rookie deal. Yeah, DJ, you know, and here's, here's the funny thing. Like, if, if you ask us um, to build a team, what I would suggest is the younger the quarterback, the more experienced I want on the perimeter. As that quarterback gets into year four and five, he should be able to develop from game manager to playmaker. And as he becomes the playmaker, now I can remove some of those older pieces for younger, cheaper pieces because now my experience is in the quarterback. My quarterback is now tasked with elevating the people around him. But I think the team has to understand that evolution. They have to foster that evolution. And as soon as he evolves into that playmaker spot, then you can start removing some of the older pieces while developing the younger pieces and you shouldn't have the drop off. Kansas City is the perfect example of that, oh, they removed Tyreek Hill and some of the other stuff, but Pat Mahomes was ready, and the offense hasn't skipped a beat. Now, what about you want to see Cooper? that evolution because as you pay the money, yep. 
I mean, that's another one, right? I mean, that's the Dallas Cowboys. Dick Amari Cooper was a $20 million receiver. He goes off, and, and Dak, it yep. was a little bit of a roller coaster ride, but they trusted him. He's going to be able to elevate the rest of these guys, which for the most part he has, especially as you get to the playoffs. The one that's interesting is Josh Allen. I feel like I'm trying to rack my brain. Like, what have they lost since he signed that big money deal? I, I don't know how, they're, how Brandon Bean's pulling it off, but I don't feel like there's been any subtractions there on that list. Now, I know there's going to be a line of people that want to get paid. Gabe Davis is probably going to be in that mix. Uh, going forward, but they have uh, they have been able to pay the quarterback without really any subtractions off the top of my head. You tell me if I'm missing anything. No, nah, they don't, and I would say the one thing that they haven't had is they've been relatively cheap at the running back position. There is a way to do this, DJ. Like, we always talk about the quarterback occupying yeah. the big piece of the pie, and they do occupy that. Well, that just means that some of the other people got to take smaller pieces of the pie. And we know, we talk about quarterbacks, we talk about pass rushers, and a handful of playmakers. Those are the guys that get the big slices. Everybody else, you got to fend for yourself. And so that's where the drafting comes in because you have to be able to fill in the, the, the gaps with drafted players on cheap contracts. And so it works hand in hand. And another example, uh, Trevor Lawrence took a major leap this year. Well, let's yeah. look at the weapons that they surrounded him. Christian Kirk, free agent. Evan Ingram, free agent. Marvin Jones was an older player that he has a free agent a year ago. That's and Zay yeah. Jones. And so that is how it has to work. Young, surrounded with experience. As he gets older, then you can bring the young guys that they can develop with him. Yeah, I love it. It's smart. It's just smart team building really is what it is. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back here. And we're going to talk about some of these draft prospects, focusing on one position. We're going to look at the corners. Uh, passing league, as we always say, you got to be able to cover. Uh, I think it's a pretty good draft for corners. We're going to dig into some of those names uh, and discuss right after this. All right, Buck, it's, uh, it's that time of year. I've got a mock draft I have to turn in later today. I believe that'll be coming out here soon. Um, so been watching a ton of these dudes. You got the top 50 coming out next week. I know it's, it's that bear that jumps on both of our backs this time of year trying to get our uh, arms around this draft class. So uh, with that being said, I thought it'd be fun just kind of maybe look at one position and, uh, and have a little bit of a chat, not even just about the players, but kind of philosophically what we're thinking, uh, where things are headed in scouting and what's going to be appreciated and, and valued. So if we're looking at corners, I'll give you kind of the, the clumps that I have right now. We always talk, you know, mm -hmm. hey, get them in the right neighborhood early on. We'll get them in the right house eventually. Uh, but for me, the top corner in the draft is, is Devin Witherspoon from Illinois. I think he's unbelievable, man. Just instincts, mm -hmm. Uh, outstanding route recognition, drive and play the football is uh, is really really special. Now he's going to be a little light. He's listed at six foot, buck eighty, so he's probably going to be five eleven and change. Hopefully, puts on just a little bit of weight, but a an elite mover, elite instincts, and as you can see here, his ability to turn, find, and play the ball uh, is exceptional. Just a big time, big time ball skill. So uh, that to me is is the best of the bunch. And didn't really know much about him before I popped on the tape. Uh, but man, to me, you know, ball recognition, ball awareness, ball skills, you got movement to match that. I'm going to forgive a little bit of the size limitations there in terms of the weight. Yeah, DJ, I think when you're evaluating corners, I think it's important to separate them in the right buckets. Like you have your bump and run man to man corners, guys who have movement skills and fluidity and guys that might even be straight line, but have exceptional athletic traits that allow them to snuff out people. And then you have your guys that are what I call like the, the off uh, the ball corners, guys that can play with great instincts and awareness. They can turn and drive and transition. They have great ball skills because they're ideally suited to play in zone coverage. Uh, when you talk about Witherspoon, like, and I'm just watching him, how easy he moves. He might be one of those guys who has the full toolbox, meaning you may be able to ask him to use a variety of techniques, and he's very comfortable on the corner. It's funny because Sauce Gardner got kind of pegged as a nose-to-nose -nose guy, but then you watch him with the Jets, and he was able mm -hmm. to do more things, had a bunch of plays, and, and did a lot. And so as much as we look at the tape for corners, I believe it's necessary. It's almost mandatory. I got to see him work out in person. Because then I can really see what tools they have. But in looking at him on tape, man, Witherspoon has a lot of stuff to work with. Very, very excited about what he could be at the next level. 
There's a play against Virginia, Buck. He's in zone, right? So he's outside on number one. Number one comes inside. All of a sudden, you got the back to the flat. He passes him off. He picks up the back, but he keeps his eyes back towards the quarterback, reads him, gets from about the two-yard line down there in the red zone to the back line to, to get his hand on a ball on a back line throw coming from left to right. I'm like, dude, he went from here to here to there, bang, make a play on the ball. I was like, okay, this guy can... As, our, as my uh, old quarterback coach used to say in college books, sometimes you got to be able to sit on the porch and see all the way around the house. Uh, he has uh, unbelievable <laughs> vision and, and, uh, and instincts, man. So he, is a, he is a really good player. Uh, so he was my highest rated guy. Now, the next group I've got ban- uh, bunched together. Brian Branch, who plays nickel for Alabama, who is just a playmaker inside, excellent blitzer, tough, really good tackler. As we talk about, you know, corners being able to tackle is big. They're going to identify you and attack you in, in run fits. This guy's exceptional there. Now, in terms of like elite, you know, man-to-man skills, good, good, not great. That's why I have him just a notch below there. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think he's going to be a day one nickel. Joey Porter Jr. outside, you know the name. It's obviously, mm-hmm. you know, we know how good of a player his dad was. Really long. He's going to have, I think his arms are almost 35 inches. He's got ridiculous length, rare length. Uh, toughness. He's a little bit leggy. Um, some of the, you know, the fluidity and the suddenness and urgency there. Uh, maybe more of a build-up guy. Uh, but those two guys are traveling together for me in that next group. Again, a nickel uh, versus a big outside corner. Be interesting to see how teams value the difference between those two players. Yeah, the one thing that shows up in, in, in all the clips, they both can tackle. And DJ, we talk about now. Yep. Uh, you, you, you can't put the guy out there that is just a cover corner. He has to be able to tackle. He has to be willing to engage as a run supporter. He also be, has to be willing to tackle these big wide receivers, the Debo Samuels. I mean, look, even Traylon Burks from Tennessee, 220 pounds. You have to be able to thump and get people down. And so, and Joey Porter and Banks, you're talking about two guys that are very comfortable playing in space, but both guys, they see the ball, the ball's released, they attack the receiver, they get them down. Man, that is a huge check mark that you have to put. No longer can you ignore or kind of dismiss some of the tackling. Those guys hurt you in the game's biggest moments. You have to be able to tackle in today's game. No doubt. Um, the next little tier for me, the next little clump, uh, I've got two guys. It's uh, it's Christian Gonzalez from Oregon, who's height, weight, speed. He's going to be you mm-hmm. know, almost 6'2". He's going to be 200 pounds. He can really run. Um, again, similar to Porter in that I don't know that it's just sudden and urgent and immediate. Um, it's just kind of he's a fluid, smooth mover, and then he can gain ground uh, down the field. And then one of my favorite players. Now I'm anxious to see how big he is. I don't know what the weight is, Buck, because he's listed at six foot a buck eighty. He looks rail thin, but get to know this dude, Emmanuel Forbes from Mississippi State. This dude is a ball hawk. I'm at. The, I think he had three pick sixes in the games I was watching. One is a is a bubble in the Kentucky game. He knows it. He sees it. Flat foot drive, uh, takes it back off Levis. Pick six. Um, he was uh, I think it was what East Tennessee State. He had another one. Um, there's another game in here as well. Blocked a field goal in the A and M game that I watched. Just a football player, man. And I, I looked at him wearing that Mississippi State helmet, and I was thinking, is this like a Fred Smoot? 2.0, old school Fred Smoot is who he reminded me of. And then yeah. think of another guy I was around later in his career with the Ravens in Samari Roll. Samari Roll was stick skinny, but was just a football player with incredible instincts and ball skills. So I hope he's not 165 pounds. I don't know. I, I haven't seen him in person. I just know his tape is freaking awesome, man. He is fun to watch. Yeah, t- yeah, tape is awesome. And when you think about ball skills and how that matters, DJ, you don't have to look any farther than Marcus Jones, who made uh, all-pro recognition for his return skills. But he had a bunch of plays where he was always around the ball. And when you go back and watch him at Houston, he was around it. Different stylistically, but ball skills matter. And it really translates well to the National Football League. It's important that you understand fit and scheme. Your scheme has to match what they bring to the table. But those ball skills are hard to find, and it's hard to find DBs that can catch it and track it. Yep, no doubt. And uh, the other pick six was in the A&M game, by the way, looking at my notes. He has a pick six in the A&M game. He has a blocked field goal. Uh, anyways, good football player. The next tier for me, and we won't spend much time here. I know we're running out of time, but Keely Ringo uh, from Georgia. Height, weight, speed, track background, going to run really, really fast. Just a little bit tight, a little stiff. You saw him get... Uh, beat up a little bit in the last couple games of the year. Uh, a name that people might not be as familiar with, Deontay Banks from Maryland. Another big, 
big corner. He's going to be close to 6'2", 200 pounds, and another one that can really run. Uh, he's in that group together. And then Tyreek Stevenson is uh, verified over six foot, uh, 204 pounds from Miami. He, I would probably have Stevenson over, over the rest of this group. Uh, fast, physical, tough, aggressive dude. Um, a, a game against your, your Tar Heels, he got beat up a little bit down the field, but a, a good football player. And that's kind of that clump of big corners. They're going to ride together, and we'll sort it out as we go along. Okay, well, here's what we do know. The National Football League is a copycat league. The guys who had immediate success as rookies were all over six foot. You think about Sauce Garner. You think about Tariq mm-hmm. Willen. So now all those guys that are six foot or taller, they're going to get pushed up because everyone saw the success that those long corners had, and they're going to kind of give them a little bump up and give them the benefit of the doubt regardless of what their tape looks like. So when you're six foot or higher, six foot or taller, and you have size and speed, yeah, you're going, and you're going to go early because people value that size. You, you just can't get enough big corners in your secondary. Yeah, I should have put Riley Moss from Iowa in there as well. He's in that clump with me. And then right below that, um, you've got Clark Phillips, Cam Smith. I know Cam Smith's going really, really high in these mock drafts. I'm not quite as high on him, uh, but he's in that next tier for me. So a lot of different clumps to, to kind of sort through. Again, I let these guys travel together through this process, and you sort them out as we go. going to see a, uh, a few of them at the All-Star Games here uh, coming up as well. So I, th- I just want to take a little time. Let's just do a little, little draft, drop a little sprinkle of draft there. Uh, in for everybody. Again, we'll have mock drafts coming out soon. We'll be jumping into this with both feet. But uh, it's fun to start talking about some of these dudes, Buck. Yeah, some of these dudes. And I'm going to tell you this. Clark Phillips is going to run, and he's going to run real fast. <laughs> yeah. No, no. No, He look, he makes plays, too. He just he just small. Um, he's small, and he's, he's not little. an elite athlete he's, he's in just terms little. of the change of direction stuff. Compact. Compact dude. Um, anyways, listed at 5'10", a buck 83 bucks. So we'll... Yeah, we'll see. We'll see on that one. But a playmaker, tons of production, tough, all that stuff, no doubt. Um, all right, anything else you want to hit before we get out of here, Buck? Nah, man, great discussions today. Like, as we get closer, and this is a good part of, like, what happens when we get to the postseason. DJ, we can put all eyes on these games, and then we can take what we see in these playoff games and really talk about the team building process, which is always a lot of fun. I have no doubt. Uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it. Hanging with us. We'll jump in and preview these games for the weekend coming up on the next episode. That's going to do it for us. Remember, you can find all of our content on the NFL's YouTube channel, NFL.com, and the NFL app. We'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks. <laughs>